the title, I actually have some notes. I think I have some notes. I have some. I'll not be guaranteed to follow them. Because he's in charge, amen? He's in charge. But I, I did write down <clears throat> two possible topics, which will just give you a little idea of the way we're going to go. The first one was, there's more. That's rather common, as if we didn't know that, right? And <laughs> there's more. And then the second one is being glory. Being glory. Now there's always more when it comes to the majestic king. There's always more than we have ever perceived, that we have ever known, that we have ever stepped into. There's always more. And I have an idea that's an eternal statement. That even when we see him face to face, then we will realize part of the depths of what we have not known. And that every day that dawns in eternity, and by the way, the word eternity indicates passage of time. And when we step into that eternity and we live in eternity and have another day in eternity, we're going to discover there's more. This endless, magnificent, Lord of ours. In John 17, and I'm going to be all over the place, if you have something to write with, you probably will want that. I won't always read. Sometimes I'll just quote, but I will try to tell you where it's from. All right. In John 17, which many of you know is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, <clears throat> for it describes the work that the Holy Spirit did after Jesus prayed and finished his work. And everything we're going to talk about has to do with the finished work of the New Covenant, which oftentimes we have confused uh, with many other things. But in verse number 22, where he's praying not just for the apostles, but for those who would hear his word through the apostles. Yes, after the first one that they may be one in verse 21, in the love that he and the Father have. And the second one is, and the glory which you gave me, I've given them, that they may be one. So glory, we're learning to be glory. You are the glory of the Christ. You are the glory of his being in the midst of your world. You are his glory. Then I want us to turn to Ephesians 1. I really thought that this was where I was going to spend the time, but it ended up just being a part of it. And that's the first part of it. I thought I had that marked. I do. Yeah. Ephesians 1, and I'll just start in, in verse number 3 and read a few. Whoops, soundboard's having trouble. Thank you, Jesus, for a new soundboard. Amen? Amen. All right. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all blessed spiritual blessings. How many? All. All. And then he goes on for the, down through verse 14 to describe them. But I want us to go, and he says, in heavenly places in Christ, in the heavenlies. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation. Some of your modern translations will say creation. It's not creation. It's foundation. It's before, it's a throwing down, before the seed of the foundation was planted of the eon, the age, the world, that we, and my translation says, should be holy and without blame before him. Uh, literally, it says that we be holy. No should to it. Yes. It's not even in the Greek. That we be holy. All right? And blameless before him in love. 
having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. I'm going to stop right there, mark out the world adoption. It's the poorest translation of any word I've known anybody to do, and modern translators still do it. The word here is not adoption, as we understand adoption. I have two adopted children. They are precious sons, but they don't look like me, and they don't look like Joe. They look like a lady named, I won't even give her her name because this will go out on the air, but a dear lady in Vermont who gave birth to them. We got them at two and a half and four and a half. I have two natural born children, and they look like that man back there. They have his eyes, they have his hair. They sound a little bit like me, but they look like my Joe. But Paul and David don't look like us, but they carry the Godfrey name. And once you adopt children, you cannot in this nation ever disown them. They're always Godfrey's. But they don't look like us. They're not of the same bloodline. In fact, they're quite Scottish. Very Scott. While Joe and I, had, Joe has some Scott in him, but mainly it's Irish for me. So they don't have the same bloodline. This isn't talking about that. He never adopts anybody. Everyone must be born again yes. or born from above. Yes. There's no adoption process there. Right. The word meant in the Hebrew culture, or the Jewish culture of the day, as the time being, and the word is weothesia, and the word means son of God in place or an in-placed son of God. Not just one born that would be called a son of God, but a son of God who had received a, a, a placement. This would happen when, and, and you've heard this from Cindy, you've heard it from me, when they would have a ceremony. The Jewish would have a ceremony. And when the older son was of a good age to receive the power of attorney over the father's business, the father would throw a, a big party and he would place his son on a platform and the father would step off the platform and in a loud voice say, Behold, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And that son then had the power of attorney over everything the father owned. Until then, he wasn't regarded as S-O-N in place. That's a son in place. He now can take the family business and he can now order it. What Paul said is, you were predestined to be a placed son with responsibility. I used to just teach it as maturity. He didn't predestine you to always remain a baby Christian. He predestined us to be those who would take responsibility within his kingdom. All right? Now, he predestined that for you while he made you holy. And blameless, that means sinless. The blood of Jesus Christ, one time for all people, took it away, correct? Doesn't mean when I flub up, I don't need to go to the Father and get it straight. But it does mean it was forgiven 2,000 years ago. So he's made me holy. He sanctified me. Now I know there's a process outwardly, but my spirit's sanctified. Your spirit sanctified. And we are of one spirit with him. That's Colossians 6, verse 17. All those in Christ are one spirit with him. Now, I'm going somewhere with all of this. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, Paul is telling them that he's hoping they're doing well in their spirit, their soul, and their body. That's the biblical naming of you. You are made in the image of God Almighty. You are tripart. I don't know if you've ever thought about it that way or not. There's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you have a spirit, soul, and a body. All right, now that's important. The soul and the body have some journeys to make. But now you just get a hold of this. He forgave our sins. He's made us holy and blameless through no merit of our own. None of it did we merit or, or you know, we're, we're his children. 
and he has predestined that we would be the favored son to inherit everything he owns. And if you want to know what that is, 1 Corinthians 2, the very last part of the chapter, I believe, or is it 3, where it says you have everything he does. Life, death, the world, it'll just blow your mind how much is really yours. Now, in Romans 5, 17, where I'm taking this somewhere. It says there that we are to reign with Christ in life. That's not waiting till later. We're to reign in life with Christ. I don't think I wrote that down. In life by one Jesus Christ. There it shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. I can't tell you how many times I've asked the Lord how that works. How am I doing that? How am I doing that? Now, how in the world am I going to be able to literally be what he's made me to be? How am I going to be able with a soul that's mine and it's an old soul? It's not a new soul, it's an old soul. And a body like mine to be the kind of son of God that he can trust me with whatever he wishes, wherever he wishes, whenever he wishes. And I would handle it take care of it. And he's not talking about rule over like we think rule over. He's thinking of if, if the kingdom of God doesn't operate like man does. The kingdom of God operates by submission. We sang it, Lord, I give you all I am. I submit to you everything I am. I come under the lion, as it were. I am led by the Spirit of God. I am working with the things of God. The kingdom of God does not do what the world does. So reigning in life is not ruling it over anybody but me. The first thing I have to take in charge of is me. My soul and my spirit must be reigned in by my spirit. My spirit, my soul, and my body must follow what the spirit says. Now that's the key. Yeah, the, the free, um, having a good um, disciplined life might look like it's the way to go. Reading a book on trying to um, maintain your, um, how can I put your, b being a disciplined person looks like you just outline what you need to do to be a disciplined person and you make it happen, except this flesh somehow doesn't want to do that. Have you ever tried that? Every diet I ever tried, every thing I ever tried to do, you just follow these instructions and it would work for a few, you know, but then it went. There's a reason for that. It's because the mind and the body cannot really be good stewards of themselves without the Spirit of God inside. Otherwise we're bound by our um, desires, our addictions. We're bound by flesh. The only way we're not bound by flesh is through the Spirit and the faith in the Son of God. Faith is everything. Faith is there. That's what he answered me. He says, you will do it by faith, Iris. You remember 2 Corinthians 3, 18, when he says we're going from, we're being transformed from glory to glory? Everybody knows that when we're being transformed. We all want to be on the glory train where we're transformed from glory to glory. Well, that transformed word is the same word, morpho, that was used in reference to Christ and his transformation in Matthew 17, Mark, and Luke 9. When he was transfigured before them, he became a resurrected King of kings and Lord of lords while he was still in his flesh. He was filled with glory. 
he was transfigured before them to be what he is now. But he was still in the flesh, but he was transfigured before them. And then he turns and tells us we're going to be transformed. That's going to happen to us, except, of course, we don't believe that. Now, to be transformed, to be moved in my heart, to change, is something only the Holy Spirit can manage. That's all. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can manage this. And the only one he will ever manage, and the only way he will manage me or you, is that I willingly give him my soul and my body as his temple. It's that anyway, right? And I may be a stubborn temple and want to determine my own way, but he said, no, I've determined that you would grow up beyond that into a spiritual being that operates not just on a, a mental, I think this is the way to go, or I've studied it out so much, or I've read the Bible so much, I know. That's, that's a really good thing, and I did it that way many years, I thought. But really, the only way you do that is by the Spirit of God. It takes a complete humbling of everything you know by the Spirit of God to walk in the Spirit. It, may f it, 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 it <laughs> usually doesn't feel too good. But to walk in the Spirit is the way I please the Lord. Now, is the way that I work with Him. The only way we become transformed is that process. It's a process of faith. It's a process of bending to little things that don't seem to matter, that make all the difference. It's obvious when something is an obvious sin. We know to get rid of that, don't we? We know, okay, I can't be holy and blameless if I keep adding sin to my criteria here. If I keep doing things I know I shouldn't do. That's just common sense. The Spirit says, now let me show you things that are in our way. Do you ever feel like you have a blockage? Other people are getting to know him better and for some reason you feel a little blocked? Can't tell you how many people we've prayed for that that's been the case. I have some blocks in me. They don't even know what they are. And many times they can't be prayed away because they have to be recognized by something that is a contrast with my spirit and it becomes obvious this is something that I have to let go of. Now I'm going to talk about something that I don't want to let go of. But if we aren't sensitive to these things, when the Spirit speaks them, and he spoke this one through the Word, and I, I said with my mouth open, you're, you're kidding me. Now, I've actually taught this before. But you may not have been here, or you may know that we don't just hear something once and then we're empowered to do it. It takes a little while for us to hear the right ones and allow the Spirit in our hearts to accept that that really is in the book. So I'm going to, to go to where we can talk about becoming transformed this is really a place where we began to develop the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's not nine fruits, it's one. The Greek is singular, fruit. There are nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit, and you can study them all day and never be successful with them. <laughs> because success doesn't come by study of them. Success comes by submitted to the Spirit for them. They're His. They're the, this whole life is Holy Spirit based, not behavior based. Yeah, when we think it's behavior based, we can nearly always conform our behavior. But when it's transformation, that means I become someone I didn't know I was even supposed to be. 
And in, in Jesus, that's always good news because it's his job to get me there. All right, so what we're going to talk about is a, a byproduct of having the Holy Spirit and in, encountering him in reference to things. Now, when the children of Israel went to Mount Sinai. They were all gathered around the mountain as according to the word of God in Exodus 19 and 20. And then God literally came down on the mountain. They were fearful of the lightning and it says the thunder, but you find in Deuteronomy that word really means voices. Some of our modern translations are actually putting that in there. God came down on the mountain and then he spoke they're called the Ten Words of God. But he began by saying, I am the Lord your God. I am the one who's brought you here. I am God Almighty. And it says, you shall have no other gods before me. And we know in the King James it starts then, you shall not, you shall not. Well, I found out I don't know Hebrew like this. I can't search Hebrew like I can Greek. but. In Hebrew, my Greek professor knew Hebrew, and in Hebrew, that is not that kind of imperative. Instead, it is you, it carries the meaning of you won't need to. In other words, I am the Lord your God. You won't need any other gods before me. I'm all you need. You'll be able to honor your parents. You'll keep the Sabbath because you won't need to work all the time. <laughs> I have I have it. You won't bother your neighbor. I'm not going to down, down through of them, but the emphasis is you have no need to rob or covet or steal or do anything like that because I'm the Lord your God. I'm the one who is taking care of you. And because I'm taking care of you, you have what you need. Da David echoed this, Psalm 1, verse 1. Say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd. You didn't come along. The Lord is my shepherd. Say it. I shall not want. Hmm. Or need. He understood that if Almighty God was his God, nothing did he need. Paul echoes that in Philippians 4. Turn there, if you will. He's talking to the people about thanking them. It's a thank you letter, and he's talking to them about thanking them for having sent their there, him, him some help. And um, he says in verse 11, not that I speak in respect to want or need, for I have learned, please note that, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be, and all of our Bibles say content. It's not the word content. I understand why the translators don't translate it what it really is. It's basically self-sufficient. Or this, I have what I need. Now if you follow it on down, that's exactly what he's saying. He says, I know how, both how to be abased and I know how to abound. In other words, I know how to have everything and I know how to have nothing. Uh, everywhere, and in all things, in every situation, notice, it's a present tense. I am instructed. Wonder who's instructing him? The Holy Spirit. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And we will use that passage for almost everything, except when we feel like we need something. 
Now, this is not in any way to put down, pour out your heart to God. He says, you have not because you ask not. There is a place to bring all my emotional needs, all my needs, all the things that I see that aren't taken care of for me, to bring them to him. That's where they go. But Paul was saying, and I can't imagine, John, as treasurer, Psalm 19, can you imagine us sending back a check and saying, thank you, but we really didn't need it? <laughs> That's just not what we do, is it? No. He didn't send it back, and he furthermore says thank you. But he wanted them to understand their giving wasn't keeping him alive. He was kept alive because he had a God. And that God was the creator of the universe. And he was the one who had boldly said, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live not in the flesh, but by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. All in a nutshell. Who do I belong to? Do I belong to Almighty God? Or do I belong to somebody else? Most of our worries and most of our problems in relationships, believe it or not, stem from our wants or our perceived needs. Can you imagine if your mate isn't really responsible to meet your needs. They're responsible to love you. Can you imagine your friends? They're not responsible for the way you're feeling. They're responsible to love you. You're very quiet. I guess I would be too. The other day I was having a moment with the Lord. I was feeling some feelings that I don't really like to feel. And uh, it wasn't really anybody's fault. I just was in kind of a funk in my emotions. And so I started studying for this session and got here <laughs> and realized two hours had spent and I was full. Nobody called, nobody checked on me. It wasn't because anybody had done anything toward me except the Lord had filled my cup. And I just sat in my chair in my study, wasn't even in my office chair, just in my rocker. I was sitting there going, you're funny, God. You're so funny. He's the answer. Now, that doesn't mean we're not trying to meet the needs that we see and help. It's not saying that as Christians we're not responsible for giving. Lord knows all of our ministries run on giving. It's, it's not about money, but without money you don't. Right, Shelley? Without money we don't. We'll meet her in a few moments. Just, we must understand that our need meter is the Lord, not someone else, or not a bunch of people else. That we are responsible to relate to Him about all of our needs. And there's a time to call for prayer, by all means. But do you know how riddled and weighed down the body of Christ is because of all the needs that are presented all the time. And I think sometimes in our modern churches we simply spend time trying to fill the needs of people. When he has said, I'll fill the needs, you give them me. You give them more of me. And then you give, me, give them more of me still. Because I'm their need meter. When we begin to connect with the Holy Spirit in our prayer time, in our reading time, the only way you can really see the Word is through the lens of the Spirit. 
You can even translate it without that, but with that you see more. So when, when, you, when we begin to work with this, and we begin to work with, we sang it, I'm yours, Lord, I'm yours, I love your majesty, I'm yours. We're all together in this, this is wonderful. But there is a substance of it that must be taken in faith. And by faith, I let him be my need meter. And in that action, all my wants and all my needs pale. And behold, he brings them to pass when it's time. And when it's not time, I don't really need it. Paul said, I have learned to need nothing, even when I'm hungry. Understanding what the Father wanted to say, I'll take care of you. He didn't say, I'll take care of you the way you think you should be taken care of. He just said, I'll take care of you. Let me. Let me be that majestic lion. Let me be that. Because I've promised it. And I know we went all the way around the bend, but he's done everything for you and for me. He's done everything in reference to salvation, in reference to eternal life, in reference to the days that we have ahead, but he has so much more in mind for us. We're only on the edges of discovering what's next. And this was a little thing, but it can stand in our way of even perceiving the next step. And we know as we've gathered here, and we've been working in worship this way, and in teaching this way, and working, we actually only see dimly what's coming just before it comes. And learning to minister that way is really, and I'm not talking about money here, I'm just talking about how we express and what we are to do. And I, m my nature is type A. If you know any bang about type A personality, that means the ducks get in a row before anybody looks. <laughs> and he won't let me get my ducks in a row because he's in charge. I'm not. I've always said that, but I didn't know that he was going to cash in on it and make sure I lived it that way. So, beloved, As you began to work in your private time with the Lord, leave room for the Spirit to remind you of something. Not because it was wrong, but because it's in your way. And in that sense, yeah, it's wrong. It's in your way. And somewhere you need to get and you know you need to get, it's up to the Spirit to get you there. Listen to him. Listen to him. Father, you are beyond what we know. Thank you for the lion's roar, remembrance. And thank you that you are all we need. That we don't have to look around or make things happen. But that you do it most well. Thank you for all that you have before us and that the before the things that are before us, not that's gone before, but the things that are in front of us, the things that, that are ahead of us are far more than the things that are behind, regardless of our age. 
that when you speak of spirit, it has nothing to do with anything in the background. It has everything to do with what's ahead. So, Lord, we, we lean and we give to you. And we thank you in Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for sharing this time of unfolding the word. We welcome your questions and comments about this program, either by mail at Psalm 19 Ministries, 6138 South Salina Street, Syracuse, New York, 13205, or by email at Psalm19Ministries at gmail.com. More information can be found by visiting Facebook or our website at Psalm19.org. Again, thank you for watching Unfolding the Word.